if we talk about endoscopic uh, decompression, endoscopic uh, disc surgery, we should know what we are talking about. Endoscopic spine surgery does not mean endoscopic spine surgery. First, there is an inside-out technique, there's an outside-in technique, there's a full endoscopic technique, there's a particular endoscopic technique, and dear uh, Mr. Loy, you forgot Thomas Hochland. I think he is one of the main uh, endoscopic spine surgeons in the field, and I think uh, he has changed in the last century, not last century, but in the last 10 years, a lot of about thinking how to treat uh, herniated discs in, in spine, and um, so we have to think about it. Okay, I will um, tell you something about my clinical results and also about the limitation of the transfrominal endoscopic decompression and uh, disc, uh, removal of disc herniations, and the other one is the interlaminar procedure. Personally, I personally do not like the interlaminar procedure because as in the literature we can find the risk to have a dural leakage with the dural leakage complications is much higher than through the transfrominal uh, approach. So that's the reason that I always try to do everything what is possible transfrominal. Um, what was at first the purpose of the study was to evaluate, evaluate the effectiveness and complication rate of a transforminal endoscopic nucleotomy for lumbar radiculopathy independent of size, location of the NPP or spinal anatomy. What was the selection? Persisting sciatica, positive rising leg, failure of conservative therapy, numbness or loss of strength in the leg, positive MRI or CT, or OP in only one level. Exclusion criteria for the study, herniations in more than one level, previous operated disc, patients younger than 18 and older than 65 years. Over 500 patients I have be, or have been operated endoscopically in a time period of 16 months. 264 patients fully fight this criteria I have talked to you about previously. The follow-up was two years, and the follow-up rate was almost 96%. 30% of my patients were female and almost 70% male. The average age was 42 years. The main levels I have operated was L5, S1, and 4, 5. Let me start first with the complication. It is not that, that when, if we talk about endoscopic procedures, we, that we do not have complications or risks or problems. Two patients showed an increase of the leg pain after the endoscopic procedure. One patient reported an increase of this numbness. Two patients were further treated with a catheter. One patient was fused. Six patients showed an early recurrent disc herniation. That means within three months. And I personally think that I did not remove all the herniated disc material, so I think it is a surgery or a surgeon's failure. At two years old, they are very satisfied or satisfied after second surgery. No wound infection. I had for sure irritation of the dura, but no leakage complication with the transformer endoscopic procedure. How is it with the recurrence rate? Twelve patients uh, were treated for recurrent disc herniation between three months and two years. All over recurrence rate was 4.7%. The average Interval between the first and second operation, what, what uh, I can report, uh, was 184 days. Eight times in L5 as one, four times L4, five. Nine were very satisfied or satisfied after the endoscopic re uh, recurrent uh, uh, reoperation. One patient unfortunately has unchanged, and two worse after two years. If we look to the patient's own, own satisfaction. Um, I can report that an excellent or good result I could find in 96.4%. Uh, if we compare now to the microscopic, open, classical, still worldwide golden standard procedure, I think a surgeon with a good experience who made a lot of, 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 of disc operation may have also the same result. It is like uh, Sang Ho Lee has told you, it at least 
all I'm reporting right now, it's a question of your experience you may have, okay? The only, in my, uh, from my point of view, the big advantage in endoscopic spine procedure is you do not need in general anesthesia and the, you have a much, much faster um, recovery of your patients and you do not have problems with, with scars, dura leakage, bleedings, infections, etc. If you look to the leg numbers before the operation, so I can report that 90% had an, um, no leg, uh, leg numbness anymore or it was much improved. For loosening of the um, strength in the leg, uh, almost 94% did report 60% was not present anymore and 34% has reported it is much better. For the McNabb criteria, an excellent or good result I could find in almost 94%. For back pain, if you look to the visual analog rate or scale, there was an improvement from um, 8.5 to down 1.9, and for the leg pain from 8.3 to 1.7. Now, let me give you some examples. So I'm standing here and I can report that I did more than 6,500 cases already. And what is the possibility and limitation of the transform and uh, decompression? First, let me say any kind of disherniation in lumbar spine independent of size, location, and the presence of high iliac crest. Or for ramular stenosis or central spinal stenosis. Or discaniation in thoracic spine lower than TH6 can be endoscopic, endoscopically be treated. But if we talk about it, for that at least you need to have and you need to use a reamer or a burr. This is an easy level. Let me give you some examples. Here you see in uh, this canyation, uh, level 5, 6, 5, S1. And down you see the uh, X-ray control that I, I always try if I do the endoscopic procedure, I remove the disc herniation. The disc herniation has optically, visually fitting to the uh, MRI picture. What do I expect? I always try to see the freed pumping nerve, nerve roots, new root, and I always do my intraoperative X-ray control to see that my uh, tip of my forceps is fitting exactly at the spot I, I would like to be. Here you see L5 is one approach, transrominal in the female, and again the control of the forceps. Here you see already a slight frominal stenosis. Unfortunately, I do not have a pointer, but at 4 or 5 you may see um, the big uh, processus articularis superior, and it is um, particularly uh, um, narrowing the, 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 the foramen. And here on this picture, you see the patient, uh, same patient with a disc herniation that I have performed additionally uh, for a minute to me, or let me say a formula plastic, plasti. I think uh, Martin Knight will uh, explain some, what is the difference and will give also a talk about it. Here you will see a far caudal, caudal sequestrated disc herniation in four or five, almost sitting and fitting in the uh, recessus, and I do not come from the contralateral side, I come always from the, from the same side, from the ipsilateral side. It is just a question of the approach and that you have maybe to remove particularly nothing of the facet joint. For that deep it is not necessary yet, but what I ream is always only the outer part of the processus articularis superior. That means I do not destroy <laughs> and I do not affect the facet joint. And that is the reason that I do not have problems with that. Here you see, at least <laughs> normally in a very easy case, in an intrafrominal disc herniation at level 3, 4, here you see the control of my forceps, and that time I performed always before uh, additionally um, a discography. And here now you see um, the video. It was very nice, the operation went very fast. Um, from running from 11 to, let me say, 12 o'clock, you see the exiting nerve root and the disc herniation is compressing the disc, the, the nerve root. And now you see how the, I can 
remove the extruded disc herniation, as you all know. A different example, for example, very seldom, maybe I did two or three cases in my life, but a far posterior or dorsal secreted disc herniation. You can't do it transforminal, because if you do it transforminal, you will fail, okay, because it's posterior. So for that, I used an interlaminar approach, as you may see here. The distance from the midline is maybe two or three centimeter, and all these procedures I do under, flow, under fluoroscopic control, and at least if I have brought in my, my um, working tube, I bring in also my endoscope, and under endoscopic control, uh, again, you see the X-ray control, I remove the, the uh, disc herniation, and here you see the control, and the MRI is exactly fitting to the interoperative um, forceps. Now you see here a male patient with a high ear crest. I have operated in a meeting with the company of Drymax, I think it's three or four years ago. It was in, in Munich, and my first patient was a, a male patient with a cranial sequestrated disc herniation in level L5 as one. And behind me there was a bed that I can't remove the disc herniation. But I did, and not transiliac. I will show you this picture. And this is a male with a high iliac crest. Um, if you have a an, an disc herniation on, on, on the spine level, that means your approach has a little bit more steep. If you have a cranial sequestrated disc herniation, like in this case in 3-4, that means your, your approach is more parallel to the disc level and not that more cranial or steep over the disc, uh, ahead the disc level. This is also an easy case um, of um, disc prolapse in uh, L5 as one, uh, again with an example of the fitting of my forceps. I think you will agree with me. Here we'll, you will see um, typical free pumping nerve root. I don't know why the video is not running. This is a typical view in the beginning. You see some, some uh, red soft tissue, maybe from the flarum and disc herniation, then you remove it, and in an optimal uh, running procedure, you see the freed nerve root like you have seen in the beginning. Oh, okay. okay, this is a perfect picture. If, if you have re removed the amount of tissue you expect, if you have made con the control, the X-ray control of your forceps, and if you see this freed pumping nerve root, the procedure is done. Again, um, nothing for a transforminal procedure. This is a dorsal cyst. The dorsal cyst also has to be treated interlaminar. Here's a, again an example of the positioning of my forceps. This is a typical picture. If you come from the, from the interlaminar approach, I do it also carefully, not to have any complication and reason of dura leakages. Additionally, um, I used also a laser, a side fire laser. I like it in this, for this kind of uh, procedures. You can uh, shrink soft tissue with bone. It's a little more difficult for that. I, need, I use the reamer and the burrs. And I think this is the case, a cranial sequestrated disc herniation. I do it also transforminal. I make no hole into the iliac crest. I don't like to do it like that, but it is possible. As you see, again, here's the control of my forceps, and I will bring down the MRI to the X-ray control. Okay. And here again, the approach. Sure, in L5 as one with a high ear crest, your, your, your approach is not that lateral. It is more medial, and I agree with you. I have to take more bone from the facet joint but I, do, I did not destroy, and I do not destroy the facet joint. It's always a question of the anatomy. Uh, again, here, um, this behind vertebral body L5 herniated disc, it is cranial sequestrated or it's caudal sequestrated. Unfortunately, I do not have the other MRIs. It was a far, far caudal sequestrated disc herniation. For this kind of disc herniation, I remove particularly 
again, of the processus articular superior of the lateral part and part, a part of the pedicle to come at least to reach this spot and not to come to the opposite side. And here you see the X-ray control of my forceps. Also in this case, I could remove this far caudal sequestrated discaniation. And on the picture <laughs> in the left corner again, you see the free nerve root. I am very happy with this big discaniation and not my secretary, but my uh, nurses. She was also wondering what I have done. Here you see a spondylistasis, a lytic spondylistasis, degree two with a big discaniation, uh, a lateral discaniation. I think if you would have done it open, I think I would bet more than 60% of you would have fused the patient. Maybe all of you have fused the patient. If you do it with a transformational approach and endoscopically, it's not necessary. Um, here again, you see the control of my forceps. Even in thoracic spine, unfortunately, I have only one picture. You can remove it. The distance is very low not to puncture the lung. Um, but you're limited to, in my opinion, you're limited to level five, six in reason of bone and of the shoulder again. Here's the, the steps I have done with the dilatator in the beginning. You do not should pass the medial pedicular line because in thoracic spine there is something what we call medulla and uh, we shouldn't damage anything, but you can do it. This uh, discaniation is a little bit complicated, um, but it's maybe you don't see it in the beginning, it, why it was complicated. Because as you see on the right MRI picture, um, you see the, the S, S1 root on the, on the lateral recessus. And normally, if, you, if we talk about discaniations, the discaniation is compressing even the, the, um, uh, the transversal nerve root by side, and from the side you can come and you can remove it. So I decided to come from more cranial, from more not exactly the lower Cambin triangle, I, I tried to come, as you see, with my uh, X-ray control for more cranial. And then uh, I had uh, this bended uh, 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 flexible forceps from Joymax, and I could remove this uh, nice uh, uh, discanation. It was a little bit tricky, and I was proud I could get it. Even <laughs> it's published by Thomas Hoagland and me. I think in 2008 we published that we have, we, we reoperated 256 patients who underwent an open microscopic uh, uh, disc operation, even endoscopically, it is a very nice tool to do it again. You do not have to pass the old scars and the old approach from the previous open operation. You do not have to pass again. And I think this will be one of the last pictures. It was a colleague from Denmark. He came by the ambulance airplane, and she's, this patient she had a, a drop foot, uh, as you see here, with a, a intraforaminal discaniation and compressing the L5 nerve root. Nerve root. And here again, there you see the, opera, the pictures uh, before the operation and the picture below after the operation. I have nicely removed the drop foot. It was real drop foot. It was zero of five. And after operation, at, at least it was one or two of five. But uh, she sent me an email and she developed fine and now she's almost three or four or five. So what is the limitations of the transforminal endoscopic discectomy? Um, like I told you and I showed you the pictures, the dorsal posterior sequestrated discaniations. In my opinion, is central stenosis. You can do it interlaminar, no problem. I think Mr. Rutten will talk about it. Large cyst is also no indication for transforminal endoscopic um, uh, procedure and um, uh, discaniations higher in thoracic spines than TH6. That means, in a conclusion, for me, the transforminal endoscopic discectomy and decompression is an effective and safe procedure without significant complications compared to an open microdiscectomy independent of size, location of the herniated disc, and in our center, already the golden standard. And I still hope if we all see us in two years again, 
it will come the gold standard, the endoscopic procedure. Yes. Thank you for your attention.